This session is, is going to be focused on resilience and diversifying livelihood risk. I'm Tim Frankenberger, if you haven't, don't, don't know who I'm in, I'm AAM. Um, so we're focusing on how diversifying livelihoods to risk as a resilience building strategy. Um, evidence will be provided on different contexts on, on stepping out or moving out of pastoral, pastoralism and agriculture into off-farm activities and how this can be an effective approach to managing risk. So we're going to be looking at different contexts that the authors were going to be talking about on, on this um, stepping out or, or changing your livelihood strategy. Uh, evidence will also be explored on the importance of migration in its many forms as an adaptive strategy to manage risk. So I know that uh, migration has become a kind of a hot topic these days and in fact uh, some of you may be interested in the lunch meeting that Kareen's going to be over. Is it you or who's? Lara. Lara will be overseeing, yeah. So we're, we're, we're fortunate to have three great speakers up here today. Uh, I've known several of them for multiple years <laughs> and, and uh, too, too long with Dan, I think. But, um, so our first panel speaker will be Dan Maxwell uh, from the Feinstein International Center from Tufts University and he will be focusing on livelihood diversification in dryland areas of Africa. Our second speaker will be Nathaniel Goldberg. From pro he's the Program Director of Social Protection for Innovation and Poverty Action. And he will discuss migration and, um, as a strategy to address income insecurity. And then finally, our third speaker is Tanya Boudreau from the Food Economy Group, who will be speaking about off-farm income in Amhara and Tigray regions of Ethiopia and its effect on resilience. So we'll start with Dan. Okay. You want to come up here, Dan? Or? Uh, I can if you want to. I'm yeah. happy to sit here, too. I do not have a PowerPoint. I don't want to just sit here. Okay. okay. What I'll do is I'm told to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that never stops. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you, Tim. Um, I would like to just make a, a, a handful of points that grow out of the research that we've done in, in the Feinstein Center over the last probably uh, dozen or 15 years and make some general points. Um, the, the, the first one is a general observation that actually it's, it's hard to, to find a firm um, mapping of diversification onto livelihood security. In and of itself, it doesn't seem like diversification is clearly associated with either positive or negative changes in, in livelihoods. It's all about uh, understanding the context and understanding the range of opportunities that are open to people um, and what, you know, the, what the range of options for them are. So one question that arises is about the, the nature of diversification, and the other one is about the diversification of, of what. So on the, on, the, on the nature of diversification itself, one of the sort of seminal pieces of research that we've done in, in the Feinstein Center, it wasn't, it wasn't me, this is mostly work of colleagues, um, but, the, but the original one was called Moving Up, Moving Out, which is about um, the, the, the pastoral drylands in Eastern Africa, and it noted two kind of conflicting uh, or, or seemingly contradicting uh, terms uh, or outcomes at the time. One was the obvious increase in poverty um, people uh, becoming destitute and, and uh, moving out of pastoralism, but at the same time, more livestock production uh, and more marketing of, of animals and animal products from pastoral areas. So these two things are going on at the same time. And what was happening was that in, in pastoral economies, some individuals or households were able to um, gain greater, greater control over resources, um, amass larger herds, and in some cases, even, even sort of privatized key uh, rangeland resources. So they became uh, quite, quite wealthy and quite uh, much more commercially oriented. Um, but others saw uh, dwindling herd size. Large scale herders were also able to uh, better capture downstream uh, opportunities in processing or in marketing or in services. And they were better able to withstand shocks such as, such as droughts uh, and be, to be able to recover in their, in their aftermath. So that's an example of sort of, if you will, good diversification. Um, same time, poorer herders were much less able to capture market opportunities, less able to withstand uh, recurrent shocks, and were, many were eventually forced out of the pastoral economy, and you know, we, we began to see throughout the East African drylands 
uh, a kind of never never land of people living in peri urban areas around what hadn't previously been quite small towns and the the, the livelihood options for for um, people within the uh, the dry land areas, but not necessarily within pastoralism per se, uh, were quite limited and typically um, poorer people had little option but to engage in activities with extremely low wages and sometimes with negative long-term environmental consequences or, or social outcomes. So these included casual labor, which, for which there was often not a whole lot of demand, or uh, cultivation or farming, which is obviously extremely risk prone in, in dry land areas or some form of, of natural resource extraction. All of these are diversified livelihoods, but they tend to trap people in, in a cycle of poverty and vulnerability, which is difficult to escape. So that's an example of sort of, if you will, bad diversification. Um, while service-related livelihoods, say in, um, in, in marketing or in, in uh, livestock product processing, et cetera, are important, it was quite clear that more options were required outside of the pastoral economy and even outside of pastoralist areas. So this meant um, broadening the geographic boundaries of, of policies and programs intended to um, address uh, economic opportunities or livelihood opportunities in, in um, pastoral areas. And this inevitably began to focus on, on urban employment, on urban migration, and on, on completely moving out of the pastoral economy, hence the moving up or moving out title. Um, education obviously plays a huge role in supporting positive diversification outside of the pastoral economy, but um, access to education, affordability of education, and quality of education are all critical issues that need to be addressed. Demand for formal education is increasing, um, because in the absence of formal education, uh, options are actually quite limited. And the evidence suggests that access to both education and to some kinds of labor opportunities is highly gendered, so even where opportunities exist, uh, access is, is highly unequal. The second question, therefore, is, is a little bit about diversification of what? And for, for years, uh, we have talked about diversification in terms of diversifying income streams or, or livelihood activities on the one hand and assets on the other hand. But the experience from at least some of our research suggests that the important consideration is less about activities or assets than it is about the risks or hazards to which those activities or assets are uh, exposed and to which they're immune. I think one of the most telling anecdotes uh, on this grew out of some of the work we did on the Somalia famine in 2011. And there were, there were groups of people in uh, Lower Shabele and, and uh, Bai region in particular who had been sorghum farmers and had been, had been induced to uh, diversify into, into cash crop production and were growing sesame. And indeed, up until 2010, they had made a lot of money in sesame and had invested some of, the, some of their newfound wealth in, in cattle. So if you looked at those groups in 2010, uh, they were wealthier and they were more diversified both in terms of income streams and in terms of assets. But all of those income streams and assets were vulnerable to precisely the same set of, of hazards and all of them hit with a vengeance in 2011. And you saw many of these groups um, actually worse off after the famine of 2011 than they had been before, in part because um, at least if, if, a, if a sorghum crop failed, you had some fodder to feed to your livestock. If a sesame crop fails, you don't have anything to feed to your livestock besides maybe the roof off your houses, which many people uh, were forced to do. Um, so in many ways, a group that looked better at one point in time actually ended up worse off than, than, than less wealthy people at, you know, prior to the famine even if they um, were engaged only in things like labor or, or maybe had someone in town, but not necessarily in a particularly high paying um, uh, strategy, et cetera. So the issue is really not so much how diversified income streams and assets are, but how diversified uh, the risk portfolio is and how concentrated risk is in, in relation to um, the, the, the dominant hazards that are, that are in that context. 
a similar story came out of research in West Africa in 2008 around the uh, time of the food price crisis. The very strategies that made people vulnerable to production shocks like um, drought or, or, or um, other kinds of natural uh, hazards were precisely the ones that enabled people to withstand a market shock. And we tend to emphasize climatic and environmental hazards in this business, but conflict is also an important uh, hazard, as we just discussed in the last um, uh, session. And there's a lot of head scratching around what makes people's uh, assets or income streams uh, diversified enough to be able to withstand uh, those kinds of hazards. So in summary, number one, diversification is good if it can spread risks and achieve uh, income streams and assets, but it doesn't um, it doesn't necessarily, uh, in and of itself, achieve that. And secondly, diversifying um, or increasing diversification at the household level, uh, farmers expanding into livestock or pastoralists expanding into farming and other activities, may require a kind of multi-scalar integration and programs that promote progress towards resilient goals. This may involve migration, and maybe we'll hear more about that. It certainly involves um, education. And it probably also requires <clears throat> some kind of social safety nets, uh, at least in the, in the short to medium term. So, you know, takeaway point, it's, it's, it's livelihood security and resilience, not diversification per se, um, that's the goal. Thanks. So I'll start with a, a statement of the problem here. And this is one that you're all familiar with. This is the, the lean season before harvest when uh, income insecurity is, is greatest. And uh, up to about a billion people can go hungry around this period around the world. And uh, in specific examples, poverty is measured as increasing 27% in the lean season in Ethiopia. In Madagascar, before the rice harvest, up to a, a million people fall into poverty during that time. And when we think about solutions, we can start with one simple fact. A hundred million people live near thriving cities where, where there are jobs available. But this comes with risk, especially for those with the fewest resources. So they might want to <coughs> potentially migrate during the lean season to go access some of the potential opportunities that are there but they don't know what's on the other end of that. And those who are cl living closest to subsistence have uh, the least ability to cope with failure if they're unable to be matched with an employment opportunity when they get there, both in the terms of, of transportation costs to get there and, and uh, lost income opportunities at home. Oh, this is just skipping right along. So one solution to that, uh, one potential solution is offering people's in, uh, people incentives to, to migrate. So this can be basically a bus ticket to, to send them to places where there are income generating opportunities. Uh, and uh, so this was done as a, as a randomized trial in, in Bangladesh. And it gives people an opportunity to try out migration and to see if their skills can in fact match with the labor market opportunities that are there. And it may have long-term benefits in, in giving people the knowledge of how to migrate and specific employers who will know what their particular skills are. So this is just to show that this was done as a randomized trial. Uh, this was certain uh, households in certain villages uh, were, were given the opportunity to migrate. They were provided with a bus ticket. Uh, at, at the time that the original randomized trial was done, that uh, was, it cost about $8.50. So I think that was about $6 for a bus ticket and, and $2 for food for a couple days to get them going. And then there were some specific sub-treatments, uh, which I'll, I'll 
show here. And I, I, I want to note that this was research done by a team of economists, including uh, Garrett Bryan uh, at LSE, Sharmal Chowdhury at um, University of Sydney, and Mushfiq Mubarak at Yale. So they randomly assigned households in 100 villages to different treatments. So the first one of those is just giving people cash. So that's the $8.50. Another group uh, randomly assigned to get credit. So same amount, but it was, it was a, a, lo a no interest loan instead of getting cash. And other people uh, simply got information. So, th so they learned what the types of job opportunities were in these different areas. Uh, and they learned something about what the, what the wages they could expect in the different areas would be. And then uh, other villages served as the control, so they got no intervention whatsoever. Uh, and then the households were tracked over the short run and then, and then in the longer run, including after those incentives were removed. So here you see what happened. Uh, at the far right is the control. Uh, and there you see in the control villages, 36% of the households migrated during the lean season. And interesting is to look next to that as the information treatment. So you think maybe people just don't know what to expect, and it's exactly the same. There was absolutely no impact over and above what the control households were already doing. And at the left, you see the cash and the credit. Uh, and, and those look very much alike, which is also interesting. And they're much higher than in the control group. So uh, depending on what specification you use, 24%, but about 22% if, if you look uh, at the cash uh, and the credit combined versus the control. So that's a big difference. And it makes a big difference in, in the welfare of these households. So they're consuming the households back home. Those households are consuming uh, more per day they're consuming more calories per day. Their food and non-food expenditures are up by 30%. And the quality of their nutrition goes up as well. So that they're, they're spending money on foods that they prefer to eat. They're, they're eating 35% more protein. They're also spending more money on, uh, on child expenditures, such as, as education. So here's the, the, the longer term. So, uh, Starting in 2008, when the original experiment was done, it was that difference from 36% up to 58%. When in 2009, uh, this is after, th they're no longer getting that, the, the $8.50 treatment here. Uh, and, and households are still migrating more. So they've, they've learned something that it produces benefits for the households, and then they kind of know how to do it. Uh, and it's, it's still up in 2011. Evidence Action is now scaling this program uh, and uh, Natalie is over in the corner from Evidence Action, so she can serve as a resource person for people who are particularly interested in this program. Uh, and they've calculated that, that no lean season is five times more cost effective than providing direct food aid. Uh, and they're also working with the, with the original researchers to answer some more questions uh, as they scale up the program. So some kind of fundamental questions, which you can uh, kind of wonder, since this is so positive, why were households kind of not doing this in the first place? And then looking at a more complete set of, of impacts, so not just on, on household consumption, but on spillovers on, on households who don't migrate. Uh, it could be spillovers on, on people in the cities where people are, are migrating to. Uh, and, uh, and looking at the, both the spillovers, uh, and you can look at things like um, impacts on, on wages across the, the original villages where the migrants are coming from. Uh, and, and they do this by randomizing the density of the treatment. So some of the, some of the villages, uh, they, they just do a few households per village, and in others, they do a larger number. That's all you kind of need to know from, from this slide, is to look at these general equilibrium effects. And what they find is pretty dramatic. So uh, the, the uh, agricultural wages among males in, in these villages, among the people who do not migrate, go up between 4.5 and 6.6%. Work hours go up from 11 to 14%. And so overall income in the home villages goes up from sending these migrants out. 
Uh, and No Lean Season is now, uh, they're replicating this program, they're scaling it in, in Bangladesh, uh, and they're now doing this uh, in Indonesia uh, as the first pilot outside of Bangladesh. So they're, they're planning to reach 150,000 households in Bangladesh this year, and they are actively looking for opportunities to take this to new countries. So uh, if this seems like something that would be interesting to you, I would encourage you to contact Natalie over there. So thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be um, providing some um, evidence from um, uh, Amhara and Tigray regions in Ethiopia about the importance of off-farm income and its relationship to resilience. If I can get this to work, hang on a second. Uh, and the evidence base that I'm drawing on is the household economy analysis um, information from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about HEA today. If you're interested in, in asking any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them later. But I did want to briefly mention that there are now, uh, HEA's sort of been in use for the last 25 years or so, and we now have about 500 livelihoods uh, baselines from around the world. And what's particularly um, interesting is that we have uh, baseline data from two different time periods, about a decade apart now, in around 100 livelihood zones provides a really interesting um, and useful uh, base for looking into how livelihoods have been changing over the past decade. So I'm actually going to be drawing on that data um, to take a look at uh, what's happening in Ethiopia. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be looking in Tigray at whether an increasingly diverse off-farm income portfolio has improved households' resilience in the face of drought. So this map that I'm showing on the screen right now comes from the Atlas of Ethiopian Livelihoods. And what it's showing is areas where migratory labor is a source of cash income. So the dark green areas are places where households are earning income from migratory labor every year. The light green areas are those where it typically is only used as a coping strategy in, in bad years. And as you can see, for Amhara and Tigray region, um, there's really a very high reliance on migratory labor in these areas. And not coincidentally, these are also areas uh, that the famines of 1970s and 1980s hit the hardest. Uh, one point I'd like to make is that um, casual labor and off-farm labor tends to be the domain of the very poor and poor. Um, precisely because productive assets tend to be um, concentrated in the hands of middle and better off households and the poor households can't uh, manage to meet all of their uh, needs with on-farm uh, production. So as an average for the region of Amhara, and this is taken from the most recent baseline, um, off-farm casual labor accounts for around 20 to 30 percent of annual uh, cash income. Uh, that's the average for the region. There are some livelihood zones in which it's as high as 70 percent uh, for poorer households. The casual labor uh, component, the yellow bar in that last graph, is actually made up of three, can be broken into three different categories in Hamahara. One is migrant labor, one's construction labor, and one's local agricultural labor. And those maps are basically indicating where those are sources of income in Amhara. The migrant labor tends to be uh, concentrated in the food insecure highlands. Uh, local agricultural labor is an option in the lower um, productive lowlands in the mid highlands. And construction labor is associated with the, uh, the really rapid growth of regional towns and also links to Addis Ababa. So this is actually a graph that's showing um, cash income from casual labor markets by market type as a weighted average by livelihood zones. So these are 23 livelihood zones in Amhara that, that are shown uh, along the x-axis. 
And uh, the blue is showing you the contribution from migratory labor, the brown is from construction, and the green bits are from local agricultural labor broken into harvest and cultivation labor. Households often engage in more than one type of casual labor throughout the year seasonally, as you can see from uh, the NWB livelihood zone. Um, and it's important to note that the demand source for each one of these is different. So there's local demand from middle and better off households that is generating the income for the uh, agricultural labor. Um, construction labor is generally uh, demand from regional towns in Addis Ababa. And the labor migration comes from large farms, usually in western Tigray, Aromia, other parts of, uh, of, of even afar sometimes. Uh, and I think one of the points that's coming out of certainly Ethiopia over the last decade is that it's really important to understand the demand side of the off-farm equation because that links directly to resilience. And this is a point that Dan already made, but that a shock to any one of these labor markets will have a direct impact on households' access to food and cash income, and ultimately their resilience. Uh, so a uh, change in sesame prices is going to affect the labor demand for uh, migratory labor. Obviously, a change in production is going to be affecting local um, ag labor demand. So this point is made a little bit more clearly in, in, in this slide. And these are uh, two maps that are showing combined household crop production uh, from the two baseline periods, 2005, 2006, and then 2015, 2016. So the yellow parts of the, well, basically, um, this is showing uh, household production uh, as, a, as a weighted average for the livelihood zone. And the orange zones are the least productive. The dark blue are the most productive. And what I want to basically point out here is that in the North Wolo Highland Belg zone, you see a drop in production between the two uh, periods of time. In Southwest Woinodega wheat uh, zone, you see an increase. And the question is, how is this then played out in terms of local agricultural labor? So if we take a look now at the old reference year data showing those casual off-farm markets versus the new reference year, you can see that in the zone where the production dropped, NHB, uh, households used to actually hire poorer households for local agricultural labor. But because production has gone down so significantly, these households are now only able to migrate. By the same token, in southwest Woinadega, uh, households used to have to rely on construction labor, and now they're able to stay closer to home. So understanding these links between households within a community helps us to leverage existing relationships in order to build resilience. I think it's also important to keep in mind, and, and again, this is something that Dan mentioned and Nathaniel mentioned, the costs of off-farm income. So it's there's a reason that people want to stay closer to home. Um, migrant labor is expensive in all sorts of ways, both hidden and immediate. Uh, for example, the migrant labor that these uh, households are engaged uh, in tends to be in the lowlands where malaria is rampant, and the health costs uh, risks are, are quite high. The cost of transportation and living away from home eat away at profits. And there's also social cost to splitting up families for months at a time and leaving up a much bigger burden on women who stay behind. All of uh, the off-farm activities have costs associated with them, and I think these need to be factored in when we're thinking about building, using this as a strategy for building uh, resilience. So moving on to the question of whether uh, increasing off-farm diversification in Tigray actually helps to build resilience, Dan already answered this question. But the, the answer is it really depends. Um, so we're using the two reference years for um, the central mixed cropping area in Tigray to try to answer, to at least explore this question a little bit. As you can see from the rainfall data, these years were not very different in terms of rainfall. They were both relatively good years production-wise. And what we're seeing is that the, from the old baseline data, you can see that sources of cash for very poor households in, in the CMC uh, d before depended on off-farm labor, but it was mainly migratory and local ag labor. Um, in the new baseline, you're seeing diversification and addition of construction labor, which is really uh, driven by this demand of uh, these regional towns growing up 
So the income, total income levels, cash income levels, haven't actually changed very much, uh, holding that constant or adjusting it for inflation. But the d diversification of their portfolio has changed. For poor households, we see the same general pattern uh, with an increase in off-farm income slightly and a diversification. So both very poor and poor households have diversified. Has this really uh, led to increased resilience? Well, we ran a drought scenario, and this is a typical drought scenario for Tigre, uh, sort of broken down into production and market, um, uh, the specific production and market factors that directly impact households. And what we found was that for poor households, it actually does increase their resilience slightly. The deficit that they would be facing is actually less with the more diversified portfolio than it would be with the, uh, with the less diversified. But for very poor households, it actually uh, decreases their resilience. Things get worse for them. And there's a whole bunch of reasons behind that which I don't have time to explain. But the point is that resilience effect of diversification varies by wealth group, by livelihood zone, and um, it's important to keep that in mind. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. So conclusions, mapping the demand side of the off-farm equation is really critical. Uh, the costs, both immediate and hidden, associated with off-farm diversification need to be factored in. Understanding the links between households within a community helps us leverage these existing relationships to build resilience. And the resilience effect of diversification will vary by wealth group and by livelihood zone. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I just want to make a couple of points uh, before we open it up for questions. I think uh, all three of our speakers brought up some key points, and if you remember anything, I want you to take away these. Um, first, that livelihood diversification, uh, it's important to understand it in relationship to risk profiles. And uh, so just diversifying into a number of different activities, even though you're in the same risk profile, may not make you more resilient. Um, but it depends on the context, of course. Uh, the other thing that's important here is that migration can be uh, an important strategy for uh, managing risk and can have a, a, not only a household effect, but even a village effect. But I also think what's critical here is, as Tanya pointed out, there are other costs that may be occurring that also need to be factored in, such as uh, the cost of health, the cost of, of transport, and the cost of social, the social costs associated with breaking families up. So I think we need to look at both, but uh, if we only, only use one criteria, uh, it may not be enough. Um, and then finally, uh, it's really important to think about the different kind of uh, livelihood zones in which this diversification is going on, and that um, what kinds of opportunities exist in these different livelihoods, and how that's affected by not only weather-induced risk that affects production, but also off-farm employment opportunities that exist for these different populations, and that we have to be very nuanced when we think about diversification across these zones. Okay, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Yes, Walter. Um, thanks, both, uh, actually, three of you. And I'm kind of interested in both presentations. I've worked both in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, so kind of just swings in my career. I think the one thing that I like to ask more insights on is the whole concept on uh, the risk profiling for livelihood diversification. And I think it does make a lot of sense. People want to migrate, people want to you know, try new options, but oftentimes there's not really a clarity on the risks that they are going to get into, both for the uh, implementers, I work for an NGO, but also for the communities as we work through, I mean, we are faced with floods in Bangladesh and people do seasonal migration, they move out to cities, they are faced with you know, totally different realities, including just finding a house uh, for the women. It's, you know, violence for, for, for men too. It could be just totally uh, being, um, you know, just underpaid. So there's just so much there that I'm not sure what your tips or advice would be for, you know, implementation in terms of one of 
potentially a model or not, if not too complex, you know, some of the things that we should be looking into as we promote diversified livelihoods and kind of the scoring or, you know, ideas on what we should be watching out for in that. But also um, in terms of for the migration specific, I do understand the seasonal side of things and I, I do feel that the skills are a big component and I know in Bangladesh, most of those rural communities will move without any basic skills. And they're kind of just at the mercy of, um, you know, what the pairs and the employers will bring. So again, what is kind of some of the experience or some of the ideas that this uh, uh, lean season, do you call it lean season? Sorry. No lean season project is thinking at promoting in terms of preparing these people for the movement that they're going to engage. So I think it's two questions. Thank you. Okay. Let's take two more questions. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I just, I, I'm just listening to what the panel was saying and thinking a bit more about what was presented in the earlier panel by, by Nancy looking at social capital. And I'm, I'm looking particularly about entry into the informal sector or alternative or employment opportunities in urban areas. And I'm wondering, is there barriers to entry based on perhaps connections, linkages or relationships which the, I guess the, the, the middle or the slightly better off or those that are not the, the poorest might have, whereas the very poor don't have. And I'm also wondering, is there any sort of evidence or, or sort of even just initial observations on the longer term risks households are putting themselves under as they start to pursue these, these migration options? What are the, the risks or, or, or hazards they're potentially bringing back to the household? Thanks. I'm, I'm Michelle. I'm with the new graduation partnership at the World Bank. And I had a question for Tanya. Um, your findings that the, the resilience outcomes differ for poor and very poor is obviously, you know, very interesting and surprising and, and useful um, to know that we need to be thinking of that level of detail and that level of segmentation. But my question is then, how do you suggest applying that to a program or an intervention where we might not have the luxury of segmenting the beneficiaries or the participants at that kind of level of detail. How do we use those findings and and kind of apply them in a in a setting where um, where that would just be really challenging? Okay, let's go first. So uh, the first one is this on? Uh, the first one on the the risk profile, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to read the, the paper that's associated uh, with this research where they develop quite a, a comprehensive model which takes into account what, uh, what people's kind of their, their income, their savings, their tolerance for risk, things like that, and builds a model. Uh, and, and here what they find is that they can kind of explain a lot, uh, but not everything. Uh, based on the, the information that they're able to collect. But the, the concept behind the, the program is to take away the risk of, of trying to, to migrate in the sense of what's the worst that could happen. So uh, if, if you're getting a round trip bus ticket uh, and food for a couple days, people can go and, and, and try it out and see if they can uh, establish a good relationship with an employer. Uh, and, and clearly many people are, are able to do that. Uh, in terms of barriers to entry, uh, the households who, for whom this has the, the biggest impact are, are the poorest in the sample. So the people who were unable to scrape together the resources or to put those resources at risk to try out migration are the ones who are most in, induced to migrate. And, and long-term risk, I think, is a very important question and part of the more holistic nature of the, the follow-up research to, to look into the fuller set of impacts of this program. Um, I'm not sure either of those questions were directed at me, but, but um, on, on, the, on the risk profiling thing, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's lots of tools out there that have been in, uh, developed to help us look at these things. What they're not very good at is helping us look at risks that are unknown, and I, I think the, you know the, the risk of, of especially long distance migration, and particularly in the absence of a, a sort of a local um, culture of migration, is is one of the one of the big unknowns. I mean, some work that we've done in, in the far west of Nepal, it, it, where there is very heavy male out migration, um, 
for, for much of the year, actually, not just, not just the lean season, um, indicates that, that everybody from, from a, a given village goes to the same place in India. Um, and so it's, it's not so much about uh, um, uh, what kind of livelihood you come from or even what wealth group you're in within that system, but actually it's, it's more kind of a, a community um, set of relationships and ones that can be that can be shared around by different members of the community, especially especially younger ones who haven't done the, the migration before. I don't know uh, how 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 much those kinds of results would would translate to other um, to other places, however. Go ahead. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I I don't um, I this was actually based on actual sort of information that was showing two different time periods and questioning whether households have become more or less resilient. It wasn't designed for programming purposes per se. Um, my personal view is that if you're going to be implementing a program that's aiming to um, get people uh, to engage in a certain kind of activity, then you it would be your responsibility to do a kind of pre-flight check on that and see whether it's gonna do more harm than good. So I kind of feel like it's important to do that analysis um, before engaging in a program. But I also kind of feel like a lot of the um, specific programs that are related, that I would think should be related, related to programming around off-farm income are more sort of systemic in nature rather than household targeted. Like for instance, I personally think that you know out of this, this database of 500 baselines that we have, the consistent pattern over and over is that poor households rely on casual labor everywhere, not just in Ethiopia, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we, if we really wanna be helping poor households, we need to be looking at ways of, and casual labor in itself is such an unguaranteed um, source of labor. There's there's no guarantees. There's no contracts. There's no health insurance. There's nothing around it. It's all based on your relationship to your employer, and so maybe we need to think creatively about building some sort of you know cooperatives to help people negotiate better. Maybe we need to think creatively about setting up health clinics in Western Tigray where we know there's a lot of migrants coming in and providing transportation vouchers. I don't know the answers to that, but I don't, I, I guess I, I sort of feel like, you, you, one, you need to do the analysis, and, and two, maybe it's not household targeted, so. Mike. <laughs> um, my question has to do with um, whether from to the three of you, whether uh, from your studies, uh, land was an issue. The, the possession of land or the lack of it was an incentive or a disincentive for uh, migration. And secondly, um, you talked about poorer households uh, being more likely to migrate between men and women, did, were there any um, differences, or which groups were more likely to uh, out migrate between men and women? Yeah, um, my question is just a follow on to what was asked uh, in terms of households, you know, trying to match really household with livelihoods and. Uh, the possible uh, negative impact of, of farm farming. I wanted just to know what factors did you consider at the household level and whether these included the size of the family. Uh, I'm asking that just maybe to, 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 to help conceptualize because one of the issues we have in Niger is we have these big family sizes and I would think that Having a, having a, fam a big family size, even if you are poor, can become really a positive element for migration. So I just wanted to know whether you did consider family size and whether the factors that you looked at were weighted, and if they were weighted, uh, how did you weight the family size? Take one more and, and then let the panelists. Okay, so I, I would. Go ahead. It's more of a comment than a question, actually. It's really making the links between the previous session that was here on this. The previous session, for those of you who were not here, was about raising our 
on awareness about the importance of perception and subjective dimension of resilience, in particular in relation to the decision of people after shock. And in relation to migration, some of the food for peace uh, or feet of the future in Bangladesh, when we talk to people in the aftermath of a river erosion, those people who have lost both their asset, their house, and their land, and ask them to whether they decide to stay in the village or to migrate. The big difference between the two groups were essentially the perception that they had about their ability to rebuild their livelihood or not in the village. Those who were thinking that they could would stay, while those that had the perception that they could not would decide to migrate. So I think some very interesting link between the two sessions. I think mine's probably the easiest of the group. Um, Lara Evans, Office of Food for Peace. I'm curious what, how donor investments, um, projects that may have been in the area, perhaps distribution of food to these populations impacted um, the choices that people made in terms of diversifying their livelihoods or migrating or not migrating. Okay, let's go first. Well, I'm happy to take the question on that Joseph's question. Um, if I can see. Uh, so the question of land, yes and no. So in, in Highland Ethiopia, uh, especially in Amhara, land wasn't as much of a factor in terms of determine, because there was an equal distribution of land that took place and, and so all households have kind of like started to, the fragmentation of land has occurred for everybody equally. What matters is ownership of oxen really, which allows people to cultivate the land. So there's a lot of land rental from poor households to better off households taking place. Um, but owning an oxen means that you have to have access to fodder. And so it's kind of a complicated relationship there. But it isn't land per se, it's financial capital, which allows you to invest in that land, and having the oxen, which allows you to plow it. Um, so there, that, that, it's not as simple as just owning land. I think it would be more simple in other countries, maybe. I, I don't know exactly. Um, the men versus women, Con consistently men are the ones doing migratory labor. Women tend not to be doing migratory labor, but they're doing the local agricultural labor, especially the weeding labor. So there's definitely a gender, um, division there. There's a certain am amount of c conflict in the data about whether women are also doing um, urban labor, because I think there is some domestic labor taking place urban, but it de that completely, I think, is idiosyncratic. It depends on households. Mostly uh, the construction labor is men, though. So th it's a very interesting question, though, because local ag labor tends to be heavily women. Uh, sorry, I think that was it for me, right? Oh, the size of the household. So in Ethiopia, I know this is a big difference with like Sahel and Niger, where these you've got these huge family so household sizes, um, and we find that in the HEA data too, and it's it's complicated. But in in Ethiopia, one of the factors that determines the wealth groups is actually household size, because the less labor you have, the poorer you are. So these, in fact, the female-headed households who are most labor constrained are the, amongst those very poor households. And that's affecting their capacity to then engage in this off-farm labor and take, that's why the poor are slightly better off than the very poor. Because in a way their productive assets are all the same, but their livelihood capital in terms of labor isn't. They, they have this, this issue of labor constraints. So I hope I answered your question. I don't have any more. Um, Maybe just to expand a little bit on the question about land. I mean, I, I think it is highly context specific. It clearly is a factor um, behind uh, what, what's driving migration in Western Nepal. I mean, the, the, the not only are our plot sizes uh, declining, but you know there there are a lot of other constraints to to agriculture and to any kind of agricultural expansion besides uh, sort of intensification on the on those particular plots. Um, in, in, the, in the pastoral areas, obviously, it's not so much land as it is um, who has access to grazing, and particularly who has access to dry season grazing and, and water. And some of those resources are becoming um, increasingly controlled by a smaller and smaller number of people. So it's not exactly land per se, but it's access to you know, natural resources more broadly that is driving a lot of people out of, out of pastoralism. Um, the the uh, 
the men and women question is interesting, and I'm, I'm only familiar with a limited uh, number of data sets on this, but in, in Nepal, it's, it's the men who are involved in the long distance migration to India, but a lot of women are involved in, in local migration for, for you know, equal sort of income earning kinds of opportunities uh, with all kinds of impacts on, on households if, if both the parents are, are gone. Um, I just wanted to add a comment maybe on, on the last round of questions, um, and maybe it gets a little bit to your question about donors, but um, there, there's, there's a, sort of a, 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 an assumption, I think, being uh, tossed around here that if, if migration is an important component of livelihood strategies, then, then, then uh, donor-funded programs or, or um, agency programs generally and, and, and government policy ought to support it. But I think many, in many cases, what we see is exactly the opposite. Um, y you know, the, 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 the study that we're doing in, in Nepal is, a, is a associated with uh, a large-scale um, program that the, the donor and implementer shall remain uh, anonymous. But uh, the, the whole purpose of that program is around livelihood diversification on farms. And so, you know, the, the, the research is saying, look, everybody's, everybody's moving off the farms, but, but the program objectives are all around um, D diversifying uh, livelihood activities on the farm, engaging in, in service uh, kinds of um, activities towards rural agriculture, or diversifying into things like beekeeping or you know, other kinds of rural activities. Um, so in, in, in some ways, the, the, the programs and the policies that underpin them uh, are still kind of flying in, in the face of a lot of this kind of evidence. And you know, it harkens back to stories from, from Tanzania in the 1970s that had one of the highest rates of um, urban migration in, in the world, the government was, was, was actively engaging in, in taking people out of Dar es Salaam and taking them back to their villages of origins, and people could usually get back to Dar es Salaam more quickly than the trucks that took them home. <laughs> so there's, you know, <laughs> there, there is a kind of current here that, that people are swimming with that I think we need to understand uh, fairly well. Uh, I'll just quickly add. Uh, men versus women. This is Bangladesh. This was uh, this was men. This the activities that they were engaging in uh, for these uh, seasonal livelihoods were like rickshaw pulling or, or hauling bricks. And then I don't have good information in terms of what food aid was available. Uh, presumably some, because this is the kind of most famine-prone part of the country. But what's nice about doing this in the context of a randomized trial is we kind of take the state of the world as given. So we we know that what we're looking at is over and above what's happening in the control villages, which would have just as much access to, to food aid. And when you see such impacts on, on household consumption, including food consumption and the quality of food that's consumed in the household, uh, there's a kind of uh, case to be made that the existing food aid uh, is not sufficient. Okay, any more questions? Yes, I'm Siaka Milogo from Burkina, Food for Peace Burkina. So I'm wondering if for the panelists that uh, I have uh, this uh, kind of dilemma that we have some time in terms of uh, the impact of migration on community participation. You know, we are implementing some activity that need community participation, which are in fact uh, labor intensive activities like lowland management and so on. When we ask the population to do some work, and that work uh, involves the participation of young people, and most of the time, the young people who are migrating. So we are here, we have a, a dilemma, what to do? Because these uh, activities are in fact to, to restore some community assets that can allow everyone to stay in the village. So if uh, young people migrate, I don't know, so we have some uh, problem to implement that activities. I don't know what is the experience in that. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, I'm Emily with the USAID OFTA. Just a question for Nathaniel on one of your graphs. Um, when you were showing the people over time and whether they continued to um, migrate, I guess my question was, was there any research done as to why, if the benefits were so good, uh, the number of people choosing to migrate decreased? Karen, you had one earlier. 
It was based on some of the research that we did um, with the prime and the grad programs in Ethiopia, uh, looking at livelihood diversification. Um, and this point that you've raised and keep coming back to about the importance of diversifying livelihoods in the context of the risk environment. Um, and what was interesting there as well is it wasn't just looking at the, the shock or the risk, in this case drought, um, but also thinking about that in a dynamic sense in terms of how that shock changed over time and how those livelihood strategies then also needed to be able to shift up or shift down um, with different strategies being implemented depending upon the severity of the drought. So for example, um, first year of the drought, um, women vendors within communities quite successful in increasing um, income. Year two of the drought, that strategy was no longer so effective because they could no longer sell to their neighbors. So second year of the drought was more successful for them to shift into um, rearing shoats and linking with markets that were outside of, um, of their own communities. So that was just kind of one observation. Um, the second thing, the other, I think, key finding of that research was the importance of um, looking not just at the livelihood diversification strategies, but how those strategies were, again, linking up with market systems. Um, so how they're clustered and then how they're linked um, was, was critical. So I guess more of a comment, but then a question to the extent um, that research is taking into consideration or what sort of characteristics need to be taken into consideration um, around those livelihood um, characteristics and around those uh, risks and, and shocks. Uh, I, I can start with the question directed to me. So I think that the question of why the uh, migration decreases over time is really important. Uh, and I, I don't have a great answer, but I have a few hypotheses. So, so the first one is maybe that households migrated a couple, so you see the migration rates are a couple, uh, are high for a couple of years. Maybe they use that to develop sufficient resources that maybe they diversified their livelihoods at home or something like that. Uh, and may potentially felt they no longer needed to migrate. Uh, the, the second one might be looking at the more holistic nature of the outcomes that we're, we're measuring, and, and maybe, in fact, they kind of figured out that they didn't like migrating. It just wasn't worth it to them. And the third one is, is what I would call the nudge. So in, when I said that in, in the model, they're, they're not able to fully explain why people migrate or don't migrate, kind of depending on the resources that they have, some people really have the $8.50. They had that to begin with and could have used that to undertake what turns out to be a very profitable activity, but they don't. And so it could be just that by, by not coming back to that, to that village and, and kind of saying, hey, here's an incentive to go migrate, that people don't kind of do things for, for a lot of reasons, uh, just like we all don't you know, go on a, a diet or go to the gym or whatever. When, when you don't have that, that one salient point where someone says, hey, get on the bus tomorrow, uh, maybe people don't do it. Um, again, I don't know if any of those questions were directed at me, but um, I, I certainly agree with the point about um, you know, the, 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 the sort of livelihood options and risk dynamics changing over time. Um, with, with regard to the, the, the question about what characteristics need to be taken into consideration, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I have a complete list, but I think that's the level of um, uh, specificity that we ought to be thinking about. I mean, it, it's, you know, you, you can develop a risk profile for any given location or any given point in time, but it's, it's very obviously time and context specific. So the, 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 the broader question around um, uh, what kinds of considerations ought to be taken into, you know, ought to be looked into in general, I, th I think is exactly the kinds of uh, uh, the, the, the kind of next question that, that's out there. You know, how, do, how do we take relatively context specific observations and, and deduce from them the, the kinds of questions that, that are uh, sh should should drive sort of program planning or analysis in other places, but I hear the train whistle, so I better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to close? N no. I don't. <laughs> 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 it's your job, Tim. I know, I know. I mean, do, you, do you have anything? To I say? don't. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks very much for coming. I think it's been a very stimulating conversation. <laughs> Um, I just want to remind you.